Well, hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And we are a teaching center that focuses on skills enhancement and overall knowledge improvement in dentistry. And today we're gonna to tackle the DO on tooth number three, Columbia Typodon. Let's take a look at the primary grooves here as I connect the dots between the central pit, the distal pit, and the mesial pit. And you can see that if you're going to cross the oblique ridge, your outline form will be very different than if you were just going to leave the outline form on the distal portion. But both outline forms are going to have an identical shape in the distal. So let's start with the distal. We're going to have exit angles that are going to make 90 degree exit with the unprepared tooth structure that will achieve a clearance of 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters, which is essentially the same as an RGS-1 width, which is 0.4 millimeters. And that's a great tool to use to uh, measure your performance in this particular aspect of the preparation. The axial wall will follow the outer curvature of the preparation as it's uh, dropped down gingerly. And this is uh, going to be slightly convex. And then on the occlusal portion for the DO, we're going to have approximately one millimeter of an isthmus area, and then we're going to extend into the distal lingual groove another millimeter. And we're not going to extend into the distal buccal cusp, we're just going to extend into this groove to be uh, as conservative as possible. We'll have a sharp turn here on the lingual, and on the facial side, it'll just sort of blend into the area parallel to the oblique ridge. This is the preparation. Uh, it's really critical that it has lots of internal retention because there's not a lot of dovetail holding in place for such a wide box. That little lingual projection you see is very important. If we were to cross the oblique ridge, we're going to then follow the outline form that we're quite familiar with. And the difference being that we have a dovetail on the mesial rather than having a box on the mesial in the case of doing an MO. This also will be one millimeter wide and will project into the buccal groove and the dovetail will be parallel to the marginal ridge and located halfway between the pit on the mesial and the height of the marginal ridge. This is to provide us with uh, ample stock of tooth structure, but we're still going to diverge that wall on the mesial so that we have a very strong remaining tooth structure there. And that projection off on the facial will be one millimeter. So this is the outline form uh, for the entire preparation. So if we can just again highlight the outline form for the entire preparation will follow in this particular manner with a dovetail on the mesial, a projection on the facial, and then S-curve out towards the exit angle. If it's only going to be a DO without crossing the oblique ridge, the preparation will take this shape, which will be a preparation within the greater red outline form that I've just showed you. So you have a DL, excuse me, a DO on one, the purple one, and then the red one will be a DO that crosses the oblique ridge. We're gonna do both today. So let's start with the box. And I like to start with boxes whenever I have an unknown outline form. When I'm not really sure what the outline form should look like, the box first really makes sense because then we can develop the occlusal portion to provide us with the ideal retention while following the grooves that are present on the occlusal. The 245 burr is excellent for this. You can confidently drop the burr the entire length of the flutes because uh, we're rarely going to break contact uh, less than that. And then we can move the burr uh, quite easily without any fear of hitting the adjacent tooth by leaving a little shell that's probably about 0.2 millimeters wide. And we can move the burr buccalingually and get a little slot going like this that's centered on the contact. Now you can then make it wider by starting at the top of the wall and sort of chopping your way down rather than putting the burr all the way at the bottom and trying to push all at once. This is one of the great mistakes that I see novice uh, operators do, and even sometimes more experienced operators, because the burr is trying to engage a lot of tooth structure and you can make a lot of mistakes. 
So by just chipping away at it from the top down, it's actually quite safe and you have a lot of control over the situation. We can just get an idea with an RGS-1 what kind of extension we need to have here. And you can see that there's a lot more extension required on that lingual side especially. So uh, not a problem. Start at the top and work your way down. And generally when it comes to preparation design for operative dentistry, for boxes, for inlays, and for class twos, composites, or amalgams, uh, I like to recommend that when you're extending your outline form, you start at the top and work your way down, but when you're refining, you start from the bottom and work your way up. So here we're just going to chip off a little bit of that shell so that we can see what kind of extension we have. Uh, unfortunately, the tooth was a little loose, so I had to tighten it up a little bit more uh, before I finish this video, but you can see the, uh, the move that's required. It's really critical that the hatchet be sharp. This happens to be a 10614 enamel hatchet. 10714 enamel hatchet is almost the same except it's slightly longer. And it's also critical that the axial depth, in other words, the, the direction towards the pulp, is deep enough to allow the instrument to be used. You can always check with the RGS and see how your extensions are going. You can see the gingival is underextended, so we need to um, go ahead and extend that a little bit further. Extending the gingival, uh, the best way that i found is to make a little trough inside where your burr is not going to be next to the adjacent tooth. And then you're going to create a little bird beak or a ski jump type margin on the most distal aspect of that gingival wall. And then you can take that and just chop that off quite easily. So you purposely create a undermined situation with the burr and then you chop it away. Much in the same way that we would make an extension on the lingual or facial, we undermine and chip as you've seen me do in previous videos. So the gingival is no different. And I think that if you follow these recommendations or suggestions, you'll find that uh, hitting the adjacent tooth will be uh, a, a thing of the past for you, which is really kind of cool. So you can see that the, the box is um, nearly completed. We are doing this so that we know exactly what kind of an outline form is required for retention, additional retention, or at least how to make the outline form on the occlusal flow with the box form. So uh, I'm double checking the axial depth here. It's less than 1.5 and more than one millimeters this way. And that's the RGS-3, which is one millimeter. And so that's about how wide we want to make this extension up on the occlusal area. So now we switch over to the 330 and we're going to start by uh, not making a punch cut, but by sliding into the preparation from the box this way. Uh, this is a really cool way to do it because you know exactly what your depth is and you don't worry about punch cutting too deep or uh, creating some other type of an error. And we can then just extend this further into the distolingual groove to obtain that additional one millimeter extension into that groove that we talked about earlier. And now it's just a matter of uh, smoothing off the sharp transitions from the occlusal to the box, which is the S-curve management. And I thought this was a cool view to show you um, how we focus on those corners right there, right there, right there, where you have a little bit of excess tooth structure and that's an important thing to do while you're uh, refining your S-curve areas. And so that's uh, basically the preparation. You can see that the little uh, lingual uh, bump there has been very helpful to give us a little bit of retention. Uh, also, this would be a preparation that I would place retention grooves in because I'd want to have as much retention uh, as possible. I don't think placing a dovetail off towards the facial would be a good idea because that would cut into the distal facial cusp. And now I'm just using the gingival margin trimmer from the middle over to the buckle to create the 
axial pulpal bevel. You can also use this from the middle to the lingual to finish that bevel. And of course, uh, remove any loose enamel rods down at the gingival. I know there's a shadow down there that makes it look like that's a bevel, but uh, really there isn't much of a bevel. It's very modest. And then now we're going to assume that the preparation had to crawl through a bleak ridge. So we're going to uh, kind of map out in our minds where we're going to be headed. And just like we did on the distal preparation, the O preparation, we're going to start with the burr, uh, basically sliding it in rather than doing a punch cut and working our way over towards the dovetail. And the mesial dovetail location is going to be located such that you create a mesial wall which is located midway between the mesial pit and the height of the mesial marginal ridge. And of course always have a little bit of a divergence to that wall whenever you're up against a marginal ridge. At this point I think we're ready to do further extension up into the facial and a primary groove and then also uh, extend that mesial into uh, perhaps a little bit of a dovetail shape. You probably wouldn't need to make uh, this dovetail shape uh, for uh, retention, but it does tend to uh, be a very common shape because there are usually some pretty affected and perhaps infected uh, secondary grooves, which will create a little bit more of a shape like that. It's also somewhat of a stylized classic design that I think that if you're doing a test, the graders would be appreciative of that type of a design. So you can see that we've smoothed off the preparation uh, pretty good. Uh, we have a little bit more smoothing to do. Uh, we're looking at the distance here between the mesial wall and the proximals, and we can see that we have about two millimeters of remaining marginal ridge there. And the rest of the dimensions uh, look, look pretty good. So you've got uh, contact broken. You can see one millimeter wide in that, that isthmus area between the uh, mesolingual and distal buccal cusp, and we're somewhere between uh, 1.2 and 1.4 millimeters less than 1.5 on the axial. So uh, that's really the preparation. Um, always see something that I want to refine just a little bit more. You could use uh, stall out high speed or maybe a slow speed for this, just to make sure you've got everything crisp and smooth internally and take another two or three minutes just to, to do that. And one of the things that you really want to make sure you do is uh, clean up the preparation of all debris, uh, blow out all the debris. You could use even some kind of a, a mild cleaner to do this and uh, with a, a brush or a toothbrush or something if you're provided with that option. Uh, you can use the chisel even on the pulpal to remove any little uh, bumps that you might see. But that's the preparation today. Uh, we did two in one visit video, and I hope that uh, this was helpful. I know a lot of you are getting ready for tests that may be asking this, and I think that if you performed in this particular manner, you would uh, be considered to have uh, succeeded on that uh, bench test. So I'm wishing you guys all the very best, and hope that you stay tuned for many, many more videos, and clinical videos, of course, coming soon to this YouTube channel. Take care.